Good evening. I hope everyone agrees that it's been a great day. Thank you for joining us for the conclusion of the Reagan National Defense Forum and our Peace Through Strength Dinner and Awards. To kick off this evening, I'd like to turn it over to Ann Korologos, a trustee of the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation and Institute, my boss, and former United States Secretary of Labor for President Ronald Reagan. Ann? Wow, what a day. Good evening, and thank you, John. I add my welcome to everyone here and to what has become the premier national defense forum in the United States. Today, we have also paid a fitting tribute to President Bush and his stewardship, and I, too, offer my prayers and thoughts for the Bush family. Permit me to reflect on a personal experience with President Bush that has relevance, I think, to this forum. The President gave me the responsibility and privilege to chair the Commission on Aviation, Security, and Air Terrorism. The investigative commission of the terrorist bombing of Pan Am 103 in 1988 over Lockerbie, Scotland. He had deep concern, most of all, for the families of those lost on that plane. Our mission, how did this happen? We were able to answer that question. Also inspired by President Bush was our recommendation in the final report that, and this was 1991 when the report came out, that we, quote, needed the moral courage and the political will to go where the terrorists are. Likewise, it is so fitting that the Peace Through Strength Awards are presented here at the Reagan Library in the Air Force One Pavilion. This is the perfect venue where we honor not only the recipients of the awards, but also all of our public and private national security and defense leaders and congressional supporters who are with us tonight. Peace Through Strength. That mantra gave President Reagan his compass for his presidency. We all have heard of the many Reagan anecdotes which were part and parcel of Ronald Reagan. Let me share with you one of my favorites, and it is so fitting tonight to repeat it. Picture Ronald Reagan once after a long, long briefing on the Cold War and the Soviet Union actions throughout the world. He summarized his views with the famous quote, well, my strategy on the Cold War is, we win, they lose. Yes, it was simple, but it was not simplistic. And looking back, he sure was right. His rhetoric was backed up with material strength, much of it provided by many of your predecessors represented here tonight. We are honored to have with us both the government and private sector here this evening, which has indeed provided America its peace through strength. Congratulations to General Keene and Secretary Johnson. And now I have the opportunity, and my seatmate thought this would win me points, because I get to welcome Chaplain Andrew Thornley of the Los Angeles Air Force Base installation to offer the invocation. Chaplain. Good evening, would you pray with me, please? Gracious Father, this has indeed been a great day. and We thank you for this gathering of faithful men and women and their collective vision for the future of our nation. May our fellowship around the table tonight be a joyful benediction of our time together. We would be remiss not to remember, though, our fellow Americans who are feeling grief and not joy tonight, the families of the ones who were recently lost nearby in Thousand Oaks, 
and the homes and the lives that perished in the Woolsey and Camp wildfires. Lord, for them tonight, we pray. Please grant them your peace and your comfort. We are extremely grateful as well for the first responders who rushed to their defense. Their instinctive desire to stand between the danger and the defenseless is really what this forum is ultimately all about. As your word sums it up, they loved their neighbors as themselves. And Lord, it is this instinct to defend the defenseless that is God-given. It is holy. And as President Reagan noted, it is intuitive to the American spirit. We all remember how much he made of John Winthrop's sermon on the Arabella in 1630. As she drove through the waves of the Atlantic to the New World, looking for a new hope, it was the immortal phrase in that sermon, the shining city on a hill, that so stirred the president. We remember it as an analogy of American exceptionalism, and that it was, but that is not all it was. It was also a warning that because of our prominence, as Winthrop noted, the eyes of all people are upon us. And so the world continues to eye the United States of America. Our enemies are ever looking for our vulnerabilities. Our friends are looking for our faithful alliance. And even nations in transition who are still politically agnostic they are watching us to see just what is so great about American democracy. And Lord, we also realize that you are watching us. You are watching us to see, as Winthrop put it, if we will deal falsely with our God in this work we have undertaken. The defense of a nation, what an honorable work. May we see the day when our faith may be sight, and the work shall be done, and we shall all know what heaven has promised will one day be, peace on earth and goodwill toward men. Amen. I'm Pete Wilson, the former governor of California, and a proud trustee of the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation. Thank you for being here. We are here tonight at the sixth annual Reagan National Defense Forum. I think it has been a great success. I think the Gipper would have thought so too and been very pleased, not just with the turnout, but with the remarkable participation that we've heard today. So for that, we thank you. Those of us privileged to serve on the Foundation Board do so as a labor of love. And some of us have had long association with the late President I was with him in Sacramento, and then two years after he was elected president, I was elected to the United States Senate and served on the Senate Armed Services Committee for six years, during which I was an outspoken, some would say loud, advocate of Ronald Reagan's policies of rebuilding America's military. It was particularly a time of great concern during the Cold War, and it was a time in which he came forward with a strategic defense initiative. And I think, as they say, the rest is history. But of all the great achievements, all the high achievements of Ronald Reagan as President of the United States, which made him a truly transformational president. 
One probably stands above all the others. And it was identified in the timeless epitaph given him by his ally, Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher, who said simply, he won the Cold War without firing a shot. Well, that is... Anytime you have that impulse, don't hold it back. <laughs> we are here because of Ronald Reagan's firm belief in what he called peace through strength. And of course, what he really meant, what he understood so clearly, is that freedom is not free. It has been purchased for succeeding generations of Americans at high cost. World War II cost some 440,000 young American lives. Why? Because we invited aggression. We were visibly unprepared for war, both in terms of material ability and in terms of a readiness to fight, at least so it was perceived. So Ronald Reagan, when he said, we must insist on peace for strength, through strength, was saying that the best way to avoid the next war is to be so clearly strong, so well prepared, that aggressors will avoid it. So tonight, I would ask you to join me as we pay tribute. I would ask first that you join in observing and wishing for continued success of the board in its mission to preserve Ronald Reagan's legacy. I would ask that you join in the tribute that we pay tonight to two honored leaders, honored for their long and distinguished service to America with, that reflects the same belief that freedom is not free and must be defended. And best of all, that it be avoided at the costs that are avoidable for those prepared to make clear their de determination to keep America not just at peace, but for a, long, a lengthy peace in freedom. So to our honorees this evening and to our Commander-in-Chief, whose, clear, whose clarity of vision and whose strength of resolve guide us still today and offer the hope that for future generations of Americans that we may continue to live strong, in peace, and free. To Ronald Reagan. Thank you. Governor, if you would uh, stay back for just a moment. Before you return to your seat, we want to veer from our formal program for something important. General Neller, if you would. I would ask Governor Senator Marine to report to the Commandant. <laughs> Attention to orders. Governor Wilson, on the occasion of your recent 85th birthday, but more importantly as a thank you for your years of dedicated service to our nation, the Office of the Secretary of Defense would like to present you with the Secretary of Defense Medal for your exceptional public service. General Miller, Commandant of the United States Marine Corps, is here to present you with the award while we read the citation. From the Office of the Secretary of Defense, for exceptional public service to Peter Barton Wilson. Senator Peter Barton Wilson 
is recognized for exceptional public service as a member of the Defense Policy Advisory Committee from December 2001 to 2006. Senator Wilson played a key role in providing independent, informed advice and opinion concerning major matters of defense policy to two secretaries of defense, two chairmen of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, numerous service chiefs and service secretaries, undersecretaries, and assistant secretaries. Senator Wilson helped lead the Defense Policy Advisory Committee in providing indispensable, independent, and informed advice and opinion in the aftermath of 9-11 and the U.S. involvement in operations enduring freedom and Iraqi freedom. Senator Wilson's extraordinary leadership and efforts were quintessential to the success of the Department of Defense and our national security. The distinctive accomplishments of Senator Wilson reflect great credit upon himself and the Department of Defense. Congratulations, Senator Wilson. Good evening, I'm Ben Sutton, a trustee of the Reagan Foundation and Institute, and I have lived the American dream. I had the opportunity to do so because we live in the freest country in the history of humankind. We're free because of the sacrifice of our great men and women in uniform, and we're free because we're the strongest country in the history of civilization. For President Reagan, and for those of us at the Reagan Foundation, Peace through strength is far more than a slogan. It's the bedrock philosophy that su successfully guided the Reagan administration through some of the most difficult and challenging foreign policy moments our nation has ever faced. In those eight years, the President took on threats that in some way resemble the ones we face today. In his presidency and beyond, President Reagan Prove the wisdom of peace through strength. Our mission at the Reagan Foundation is to ensure this proven, tested philosophy continues to serve as a guide for American leaders, regardless of party, for generations to come. We created the Peace Through Strength Award for this very purpose, to honor those whose achievements have advanced our nation's security and whose service has enhanced America's leadership in the world a Vice President, Secretaries of State, Secretaries of Defense, Senators, Congressmen, our nation's most distinguished leaders are among this award's recipients. And tonight we will add two more extraordinarily worthy names to this list of honored patriots. The award itself features a bronze eagle perched on a granite base. The eagle a favorite of President Reagan captures the strength and courage of the country we all love. In the eagle's talon is an actual piece of the Berlin Wall. It is a reminder of America's role in bringing freedom to the oppressed, but also that in President Reagan's words, freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. To present our first award tonight to a man who has dedicated his entire life to preserving that freedom, please welcome my fellow trustee for the Reagan Foundation, Michael Castine. Thank you, Ben. Good evening. On behalf of my fellow trustees and our chairman, Fred Ryan, we are really um, honored to be presenting these awards tonight. And it's certainly a great honor to present the Peace Through Strengths Award to a leader whose career is a definition of servant leadership. He's been an inspiration to men and women in uniform and civilians alike. 
His accomplishments are too long to go through tonight, but you'll see his bio in the, um, the book we had today. But I might add, he's also a friend of the Reagan Library, and he's been an attendee at the Reagan Defense Forum. That leader is Jack Keane. His service began in combat as an inf infantry paratrooper in Vietnam, where he was decorated for valor. He went on to serve in Somalia, Haiti, Bosnia, and um, Kosovo. And over the course of 37 years, he commanded the famed 101st Airborne Division and the legendary 18th Airborne Corps. Jack rose to become a four-star general and was appointed Vice Chief of Staff of the U.S. Army in 1999. He also served as Acting Chief of Staff. General Keene's service to our country did not end with his retirement in 2003. When the war in Iraq needed a new direction, General Keene refused to sit quietly on the sidelines. As he tells the story, it was 2006. He was watching a Senate Armed Services Committee hearing. In that hearing, the senators were grilling the administration officials about the rapidly deteriorating situation in Iraq. Many of you are there. As General Keene put it, the administration kept telling the senators the strategy was working. And obviously, and any casual observer of what was taking place in Iraq at that time knew it was not working. He saw the inevitable, a potential humili humiliating defeat. The next morning, he got up early and he took out a long yellow tablet and wrote down what was wrong with the current strategy, what was needed to fix it, and what should be done with a new strategy. Those notes on that yellow paper would eventually lead to a meeting with the president and vice president and become an academic paper. General, uh, General Keene put forward a vision for the now famed surge strategy that turned the side of the conflict, turned the tide of the conflict. And then on and off for two years, despite his retirement, he went to Iraq to advise General Petraeus, that servant leadership. And, that leaders, and that's leadership that recognizes the wisdom of peace through strength. Today, General Keene serves as chairman of the board for the Institute of the Study of War and as executive chairman of AM General. And tonight, for his lifelong leadership, for his dedication to a stronger America and a safer world, and for his contributions as a battle-tested veteran and strategic thinker, General Jack Keene is a recipient of the 2018 Ronald Reagan Peace Through Strength Award. Please join me in showing our appreciation. Thank you. Thank you. What a beautiful evening in the great Simi Valley. My heart goes out to the people not too far from here who had to deal with these godforsaken fires that so tragically affected their lives. You know, that Ronald Reagan's first ranch that he lived on from 1951 to 1974, and then donated to the Malibu State Park was destroyed in that fire, unfortunately. Thank you very much, Mike, you know, for your kind and generous introduction. And listen, thank everyone, I think, for the warm welcome that Secretary Johnson and I have received tonight. I'd like to thank the Ronald Reagan Foundation of Trustees for this significant honor, and to Roger Zakheim right over here, and the Reagan Institute for your innovation to start the Reagan Forum and make it the huge success it is today. I'm also honored to share this award with Secretary Johnson as we recognize his many years of extraordinary service to protect the American people and our national security. 
When Ronald Reagan ascended to the presidency of the United States, we were not only facing the global challenge of an empowered and beleaguered Soviet Union, but we, as a nation, was beset with the serious social and economic problems. Some of our allies and even our own people had lost confidence in America as we were a nation torn apart by a controversial 10-year war in Vietnam, which ended with a humiliating defeat. The impact on the military was profound. We had fought hard with honor, won just about every battle, yet we lost in the end. This shook us to our core, particularly the ground forces who bore the brunt of the war. And you listen to our great Secretary of Defense today speak to what that's like. Many leaders left disillusioned by the outcome of the war. The Iranian hostage situation, another humiliating setback for the United States, coupled with a failed military rescue was a wake-up call. Ronald Reagan knew the military needed to be rebuilt if the United States was to compete favorably against the Soviet Union. While President Reagan added much-needed capabilities to restore America's hard power, he also helped us to heal emotionally and psychologically from the aftermath of the Vietnam War. His unshakable faith in America's idealism and the American people as the indispensable nation to confront when needed the evil in the world washed over us in the military, as it did the American people. The military was repurposed under Reagan's policies as we, along with NATO, became a very capable deterrent to the Soviet Union Warsaw Pact. We all know now it was a contributor to their eventual collapse. Further, the legacy of the Reagan defense buildup manifested itself in the overwhelming conventional war dominance achieved against Saddam Hussein and Desert Storm. Modern warfare was changed dramatically forever. As we gather here tonight, there has not been a time since the Reagan presidency when peace through strength is more appropriate to describe the serious global challenges America is facing. I was a member of the Congressional Commission on a National Defense Strategy. And as our reports suggest, we are issuing a clarion call that the security and well-being of the United States are at a greater risk than any time in decades. America's military superiority, the hard power backbone of its global influence and national security has eroded to a dangerous degree. Russia and China are seeking regional hegemony and the means to project power globally. President Xi has stated boldly that he intends to replace the United States as the world's global leader. The national defense strategy appropriately identifies China as a strategic long-term threat to the security of America. Iran is on the march in the Middle East, as you know, seeking regional domination. North Korea, despite a pledge to denuclearize, has not destroyed or given up a single nuclear weapon or ballistic missile. And radical Islam, despite our recent success and noteworthy success against ISIS and the killing of Osama bin Laden in 2012, still thrives as a generational threat. The Commission agrees with the defense strategy that the United States could not 
prosecute successfully two conflicts simultaneously. Further, the Commission believes we may struggle to win or even lose against a major competitor such as Russia and China. We need to flush out the operational concepts that drive force structure and needed capabilities and capacities to reduce this risk. Equally disturbing are the serious geopolitical gains that Russia and China are making in their competition with the United States and our allies by operating below the level of major conflict using hybrid warfare and gray zone operations. Sadly, we, the United States, has failed to fashion a comprehensive whole of government strategy to contain this new form of competition, much less push it back. How did we get here? How did that happen? Well, the United States was preoccupied with 9-11 wars. Russia and China began to asymmetrically rebuild their military when they witnessed the shocking conventional war dominance of the United States in Desert Storm and also the 2003 invasion of Iraq. So much so that the technology gap that existed for decades in favor of the United States is closing. As the 9-11 unconventional wars were ending in terms of our major military participation, instead of refreshing a much needed conventional military capability, what had atrophied all during those years, what did we do? We began a period of devastating cuts under the Budget Control Act or sequestration as the means, which was a bipartisan decision in profound recklessness. The Trump defense buildup must be sustained for at least five years to get us out of this hole we dug. If we're going to adequately rebuild the United States military, and there's people that don't want to hear it, but that it should be three to five percent increase to account for inflation and some growth. Anything less, in my view, is an unacceptable risk. America will continue to be challenged as a global leader, promoting peace, stability, and prosperity, as we have in the past. We, have, we always rise to meet the challenge, much as Reagan did almost 40 years ago. Our global security challenges are different now, but they're not new to us. We can get this right. We need to inform and educate leadership throughout our government, and of course, the American people. No hype about the threat. We don't need that. We need to be pointed about the weaknesses of these adversaries that they have, and some of them are pretty serious, and be upfront about it. No saber rattling. Just tell the truth. Tell the American people what it is we need to do to reduce this risk, and we can do that. Thank you very much. Thank you, General Keene. 
wonderful remarks. I'm Susan McCaw, Reagan Foundation trustee, and I'm pleased to introduce our next speaker and award recipient. On Jay Johnson's 44th birthday, the history of our nation changed forever. It was September 11, 2001. He had just returned to the Manhattan offices of Paul Weiss after serving as general counsel of the Air Force. The experiences that day and the images of, destruction, of destructions are ones that he carried with him 12 years later when he was sworn in as Secretary of Homeland Security, the very agency created to ensure that no attacks like those he witnessed on 9-11 would occur again. A native New Yorker, he attended Morehouse College and Columbia University Law School. He has worked in private practice and served as U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of New York, General Counsel of the Air Force, and General Counsel of the Department of Defense before President Obama nominated him in 2013 to serve as the fourth DHS Secretary. In that position, he led the third largest department of the U.S. responsible for counterterrorism, cybersecurity, aviation, border, port, and maritime security, immigration enforcement, protection of our national borders and critical infrastructure, disaster response, and protection against chemical, biological, and nuclear threats. This is a man who understands that security and peace only come through strength. Throughout his career, Jay Johnson has stepped forward to defend America's people, our ideals, our institutions, and indeed our homeland. And for his service, the Reagan Foundation tonight presents him with the Peace Through Strength Award. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in congratulating Secretary Jay Johnson. Thank you very much, Susan. Thank you, everybody. I want to acknowledge the many present and former public servants who are here, just at my table, two outstanding public servants, Joni Ernst and Adam Smith, who I know well. I want to congratulate General Keene on receiving Peace Through Strength Award this evening for your long service to our nation's military. I want to pay tribute in particular to my two former chiefs of staff who were here, Christian Marone and Paul Rosen, who continually made me look good when I was Secretary of Homeland Security. I want to give a special recognition to Buck McKeon, who, as everyone knows, is the former chairman of the House Armed Services Committee, who introduced me to this forum four years ago. More on that later. I want to acknowledge my board chair, Marilyn Hewson, who, in my observation, is one of the finest leaders in corporate America and one of the finest leaders in America. I also want to acknowledge my friend Jim Mattis, who is not here, who was here for lunch. It's an overused cliche, but it's literally true. I sleep better at night knowing that Jim Mattis is on the wall. I got to, I got to know Jim Mattis while he was on active duty and I was general counsel of the Department of Defense. In 2011, the Marine Corps, Bob, the Marine Corps, honored me with a sunset parade. I asked Jim if he would be there with me, and he was. Several weeks later, I invited Jim Mattis to Cafe Milano in Georgetown. Many of you are now asking, what is harder to imagine? me inspecting a Marine Corps parade, or Jim Mattis at Cafe Milano at Georgetown. 
Like everyone else, I too mourn the passing of our 44th president, who led an extraordinary American life. Like many others, I hope and pray yesterday does not mark the passing in America of George H.W. Bush's brand of humility, leadership, and public service. So this is a long way from my debut at the Reagan Library four years ago. Some of you may remember it. I was flattered to be asked to participate in a panel discussion here. So flattered, I did not stop to ask who the other panelists were. I had the surprise experience of serving as the, current, the then current administration's sole representative on a panel, which included Stephen Hadley from the Bush administration, my two former clients, who I admire and revere much, Leon Panetta and Robert Gates, both of whom were then private citizens and free agents and had written books, and John McCain, who was John McCain. After the experience, I licked my wounds. I contemplated putting Roger Zakheim on the no-fly list. But in, the, but in the higher spirit of collegiality and bipartisanship that exists here, I got over it, and I survived about six months ago. Thank you for the honor you bestow on me tonight. I know it will be one of the greatest of my life. I nearly fell off my chair when I received the letter with the news of this. I was a second year law student in November 1980 when Ronald Reagan was elected president. I admit that I was shocked then by the election results. We had elected an actor as president who reportedly believed that pollution grew from trees. We had elected someone who many believed was a warmonger who was going to provoke a nuclear war with the Soviet Union. And he wasn't just elected. He was elected 489 to 49 electoral votes. Now that's a landslide. Turns out, Ronald Reagan is one of the greatest and most iconic presidents of modern history. <laughs> turns, out, turns out that Ronald Reagan loved peace and hated war as much as any president in modern history. We know now that when President Reagan called for higher defense spending, it was not to wage war, but to secure peace. He and his successor won the Cold War by securing the peace. Peace is not free. You have to pay for it. Peace is not the default. You have to work for it. Peace is the general goal toward which the human race must continually strive. But it is not the natural state of affairs across our globe. Peace must be guarded and protected against the belligerent impulses of far too many on this planet. Strength forges peace, and perceived weakness tempts aggression. And enduring peace through strength requires that the strongest actors on the world stage be calm, steady, and mature. A quiet confidence in who we are as a military and intelligence might, second to none, is itself an expression of strength. As Anthony Hopkins said to Larry Hagman in the movie Nixon, presidents don't threaten. They don't have to. Today, you bestow on me this high honor for my past public service. I accept this award 
as the charge for the future to advocate in my post-government life Reagan's view that peace can be best secured through strength. In the bipartisan light in which this honor is bestowed tonight, I also accept it as a charge to continue in my post-government life to advocate for common sense, bipartisan solutions to difficult problems and civility in our political discourse. Just as peace is secured by strength, the people's business in Washington must be secured by politics. Politics requires political compromise, and political compromise requires political courage. President Reagan understood this. He had his bedrock principles and convictions, but he understood that governing in a democracy requires that one reach compromise, and he was not afraid to do so. Reagan assumed the best in all people, not the worst. The last thing I'll say is a word of tribute to the men and women here today who represent our nation's military. From Detroit Tigers fan Bob Neller to the junior ROTC here who are in the back of the room, like you, my own son wears the uniform of our country. I am proud of him as I watched him grow with the benefit of basic training in OCS from a shy, tentative kid to a strong, ethical, disciplined, and patriotic young man for whom the unit and the effectiveness of the unit matters all. Many in civilian life do not understand service over self or the paramount importance of unit cohesion. But those of you in the military live this every day. You have observed some of the most powerful public and private people in natural security attend this forum today. Please know that we are all gathered here to determine how best to support you in the military and all you do to defend the nation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Secretary Johnson. Just an honor to be in the same room with you and General Keane. Congratulations to you both. Here at the Reagan Foundation, we've been fortunate to welcome, year after year, distinguished guests who have spent their careers in service to our nation and who have upheld President Reagan's vision of peace through strength. We've compiled the speeches of the past 10 award recipients in a new commemorative book that each of you will receive before you leave tonight. It is dedicated in the memory of Senator John McCain. Senator McCain called himself a foot soldier in the Reagan Revolution. He fought for the values he and President Reagan shared until his very last day. America is still mourning his loss, and we hope this book will, in some small way, help keep his legacy alive. And now I'd like to ask Chairman Mac Thornberry to send us off. I'd like to first thank the chairman, not just for his service to our country as the chairman of the Armed Services Committee, but for his continued leadership of the Reagan National Defense Forum. Chairman. Well, let me just commend the trustees of the Reagan Foundation for, again this year, choosing two outstanding leaders in national security to honor. I know, like all of us, uh, I have benefited from these two uh, men, and I will continue to benefit from their wisdom and insights. 
I just want to offer us uh, one last thought before we depart. There, I know there's a lot of concern about things happening in our country, about our divisions, about reflex tribalism, and about an erosion of the bipartisan support which our national security has enjoyed since the end of World War II. I share, frankly, a lot of those concerns. But part of the antidote to those things is leadership, especially leadership by example. And that's part of the reason I think it is so important to hold up and honor outstanding leaders like Secretary Johnson and General Keene, to hold up and honor the memory of President George H.W. Bush, and, but you don't have to be a president or a general or a secretary in order to play a role in being the antidote to the things that ail us. We all have a role. We all can be a cog in this great uh, experiment that Secretary Mattis talked about earlier today. We all can help maintain the bipartisan consensus on the big national security issues that matter and on strengthening America's role as a force for good in the world. If this Reagan National Defense Conference has helped remind and encourage us to play our role in that goal, then it will have served its purpose. Thank you all for being here. Good night. We'll look forward to seeing you next year.